All right, uh, I think we should start. Um, so welcome everyone and um, welcome to our fourth, uh, the first uh, seminar of the Yale Center on Climate Change and House uh, in fall 2020. And um, so today we are very um, uh, pleased to have uh, Dr. Xu Huili from the Yale School of Environment. So he's uh, uh, the Sarah um, Schellenberg Brown Professor of Meteorology. Uh, he's also he's also a director of the Yale Center um, uh, for the Earth Observation. He uh, also received the 2015 award for outstanding achievement in biometeorology from the American Meteorological Society. So, um, without further ado, um, um, we will have Dr. Xu Huili. Uh, thank you, Kai, um, and also thank um, uh, thank you, Rob, for uh, having me uh, in this event. Um, let me see how do I can you can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about some of our work uh, done on uh, urban heat island. Um, let me see if I can turn off the. Uh, uh, so the title of my talk is um, uh, Urban Heat Island Theory uh, Measurement and, uh, and, and um, Mitigation. So somewhere in that order, let me see if I can turn off my screen here. Okay, now that's, that's much better. Um, and and um, so the, the work I'm presenting today is really a collection of things done by folks in my lab. Uh, uh, current current members and also uh, past members of uh, of my lab. Uh, some of them are actually uh, attending this event. And I noticed that uh, this event is being recorded. Uh, that's fine with me. Um, there are a few slides where we don't have we, we are, where we can where I show you uh, sort of unpublished results. So if you like to sh if you want to share this uh, recording with other folks, please refrain from. Uh, and perhaps not sharing that part um, to, to, to people. So many, many of you uh, are familiar with this kind of projections, right? Projecting of uh, temperature into the future to the end of the century, depending on um, whether we take the aggressive uh, mitigation or scenario or more of a business as usual scenario, we will end up with very different temperature projection. Uh, in the low emission scenario, we expect maybe 1.5 degrees of increase, degrees Celsius increased near the end of the century. But in, um, in, uh, in the more sort of aggressive emission scenario, uh, RCP 8.5, the, the projection is that four degrees of uh, decreases of warming uh, towards the end of the century. So that's the kind of uh, big picture. Uh, so what I would argue is that heat stress is actually perhaps the most, the biggest climate threat to, to humans, heat stress associated with uh, climate change. The reason is simple that we humans are warm blooded animals. We have a, a biological limit we cannot overcome. So, <clears throat> so we are warm blooded, we keep our deep body temperature at a constant value of roughly 37 degrees Celsius. And in a warm climate, we need to maintain a temperature differential of at least two degrees between the deep body and the skin in order for our metabolic heat to get dissipated to the, to the environment. Right? So that's a physi physiological limit a big barrier we cannot overcome if conditions in such that uh, we cannot maintain uh, skin temperature lower than thir uh, 35 degrees, then we will, uh, we will suffer uh, serious health consequence, uh, even death without, of course, without the help of, uh, of air conditioning. Uh, so, so that's that's the kind of the motivation of for this kind of work, uh, and uh, of course we know that uh, residents in the urban environment, urban residents suffer an additional heat stress due to the urban heat island. This is sort of classic depiction by Jim Oak of what an urban heat island look, uh, looks like. If you have a bicycle, for example, you attach a sensor, uh, something I will talk about at near the end of this uh, this lecture, and you you move you across. Uh, a transect from rural to to urban uh, core, 
you would re record temperature variation in such way, uh, lower temperature in, in outside the city. And as you uh, move to the center of the city, you will, you will register very high temperature, well, relatively high temperature. And this difference between uh, uh, urban versus rural temperature, uh, in, in temperature is really what we call urban heat island or intensity of urban heat island. So that's a well accepted sort of, uh, uh, sort of depiction of uh, this phenomenon. And so this is added heat that uh, urban residents will experience. Of, and this is a sort of spatial view for urban heat island here, actually in, in the city of New Haven, the urban heat island is very patchy. Uh, you have high spots here and there and some low spots there. So the high spots is in, in, uh, in the Akia shopping area, right? And then there's this downtown area and then in the, in the near the fringe of the city where you have a lot of uh, trees temperature is much lower so that's the kind of urban heat island pattern um, that you see in new haven so why why urban heat island is a, is a concern well you can just simply consider a, a probability distribution of temperature this is a probability distribution temperature of maybe a rural background and the urban heat island would shift this probability distribution just by a little bit, maybe by one degree on average, right? But that one degree of shift in the, in the mean would actually create a, a, a serious consequence in terms of heat wave uh, frequency. Uh, let's uh, suppose the heat wave threshold is here. Now this is a heat wave threshold beyond which we will see uh, uh, problems with mobility and mortality. And, and, and for rural background, rural uh, location, this the area under this curve uh, is your heat wave frequency. Now, for urban lands, the land, the simple shift in mean due to urban heat island will, will change that frequency a lot, will increase that frequency a lot, right? And the other thing that you should notice that, of course, with the urban heat island, uh, urban residents will actually experience. Uh, record temperature is not being seen by rural residents. Uh, so the, again, rural temperature stops here. Uh, so, so this is a spread. So, but uh, um, in the city, you will see temperature beyond the record, right? The record the registered in, in, in the background sites. So that's also another uh, issue that we should be uh, 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 concerned about. So, so that is really the, 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 the motivation for why we study uh, the theory of urban heat iron and, and why we want to come up with strategy to, to mitigate um, uh, urban heat iron, right? So let me switch to you know, give you a uh, sort of review about the theory of the urban heat iron phenomenon. So this trace, it can be traced back to many, many years ago to Tim Oak's textbook. In his textbook, he listed the seven causes of urban heat island. Uh, of the seven, I uh, highlighted four pe uh, causes people consider to be the major ones. The first one is increased absorption of shortwave radiation due to uh, 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 urban morphology and maybe due to the color of the urban landscape. So the, the, the conventional wisdom is that urban land tend to trap more solar radiation. So that's a source of urban heat island. A second source of urban heat island, of course, second cause of urban heat island is, is of very easy to understand because we, there's a additional heat, anthropogenic heat from anthropogenic sources uh, from automobile driving, driving or automobiles converts uh, uh, chemical energy in fossil fuel to mechanical energy. That mechanical energy eventually dissipates as heat to the environment, right? And so another important source of anthropogenic heat is uh, space heating. We heat our houses at, or, or air, air, AC use of air conditioning and they, and they will generate heat um, to, uh, and dissipate heat to the environment. Uh, the third cause is, uh, is increased sense heat storage. Uh, buildings uh, and other sort of artificial structures can store energy, uh, solar energy, uh, solar radiation energy in the daytime and, that then, and they will release that energy at night causing nighttime urban warming. And finally, uh, another major cause is uh, decreased evaporation. You know that uh, when you replace natural vegetation, replacing replace trees with artificial impervious surface, you reduce evaporative cooling power, right? So those are the four sort of major causes um, uh, of urban heat island, island. And so the, we understand those concepts in a conceptual way, in a qualitative way for, for a long time. 
And, um, and so what we did was uh, with the, uh, a few years back was try to quantify those those causes in you know in a quantitative way. I, we believe you know only by quant by quantifying those causes that would then will, will lay the foundation for sensible sort of measure of how on um, how to mitigate urban heat island. So I need to uh, sort of take a step back and and introduce uh, this theory called uh, the, the uh, theory of intrinsic, intrinsic biophysical mechanism. This theory was first developed to actually to understand how our deforestation changes uh, uh, the sur surface temperature, changes near surface temperature. And later on, this, uh, this theory is extended to, uh, try to the study of urban heat island. So, like, so some key points here. So this theory, this pro mechanism really is concerned with the process in which surf how surface temperature responds to external perturbation. By external perturbation, I mean a number of things. It could be uh, addition of aerosols to the atmosphere that will block sunlight uh, uh, penetration and, and intercept sunlight penetration. And I, it could also be a change of urban, a change of landscape, uh, a land use change, replacing say forest with some open land or natural land by, 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 by urban land. So those are considered, considered to be external perturbations. And so a key of, of to understand this process uh, are, are, there are two, two key uh, uh, components to that. One is what we call the local long wave radiation feedback. And the other one is a uh, change in energy redistribution between the surface and the lower lay oh, the overlaying atmosphere. I'm gonna explain those two, two, uh, two processes in a little bit. So the, the way to quantify uh, the surface temperature response is really just to, to do this sort of thought experiment or numerical experiment. Uh, uh, and you can also quantify through measurement as well. Uh, it, it, to uh, the the surface response really is the difference between temperature of the old state before the perturbation and a new state after perturbation. So that's the perturbation temperature signal is really uh, the key here, and we're trying to quantify. So uh, let's take a look at. Uh, so let's go back to the case of uh, uh, deforestation study, right? The interest here is uh, motivated in part by, by the need to understand whether removing trees or adding trees will warm or cool the local uh, temperature. So I, 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 this is my favorite numerical example. Um, this is uh, uh, actual data collected uh, over forests in, in Israel, uh, semi-arid climate conditions. This is how much solar energy reaches the, the forest. And this is how much get reflected through its uh, albedo, reflected uh, away from the surface. Uh, from the surface, some escape, of course, uh, uh, escape to, uh, to the outer space. This is at the top of the atmosphere. Now, if you remove the forest and replace forest with some shrubland, shrubland is much brighter, has higher albedo, and so this uh, short wave radiation will will uh, 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 reflection will, will increase. And so naturally you would think uh, the temperature will go down, right? Because now you have more, less uh, short wave uh, trapping, trapping of uh, so, uh, solar radiation. And so uh, when uh, the surface when will undergo what we call radiative feedback, because when you have uh, low abs uh, absorption of sol solar radiation, the surface will cool and, and, uh, and therefore you will have less long wave radiation escaping to the, from the surface. And eventually you will establish a uh, new radiation equilibrium, right? Because so that, that process through so long wave adjustment is called a long wave feedback. It's a, uh, that's a negative feedback. And so um, if you allow just long wave uh, radiation exchange, only allow radiation exchange between, uh, to occur between the, the, the surface and the atmosphere, this is you can come up with a simple prediction. So the uh, the change of radi uh, short wave radiation is delta S. That's your perturbation signal, and the change of surface temperature is delta T S. Right? This uh, uh, parameter called local climate sensitivity. That's more or less a constant number. And so in this particular numerical example, you would predict um, by replacing forest with shrubland, you expect a cooling of about four degrees, about five degrees. Right, so that's so so that's an argument some people use to uh, to promote deforestation. They're saying deforestation actually may be a good thing, helps uh, cool helps cool the local climate. 
uh, because of uh, because of the albedo effect. But of course, that uh, picture is not complete because uh, in the real world, you not only have a radiative process, the radiative feedback, you also have two, uh, what I call energy redistribution occurring between the surface and the atmosphere. Uh, so there are two processes. One is uh, evaporation. Evaporation is a process where you, uh, liquid water is converted to water vapor, right? So that, that happens near the, at the surface. So evaporation, that will take away energy, uh, take away latent, latent heat energy, that will consume energy. And then when vapor gets to the top above the atmospheric boundary layer and condenses to form cloud, that energy, latent heat gets released. So the process is an energy process of energy redistribution. It redistributes energy, taking away energy away from the surface and then put the energy back into the atmosphere above the boundary layer. So that's one energy redistribution process. A second energy redistribution process is what is convection. It's really due, is, is the result of air motion, result of turbulent motion in the boundary layer. That process is also very, so is dissipating energy from, from the ground uh, to, to, the, to the lower atmosphere. So, um, so you can set up this kind of thought experiment to look at how, how, the, how the two, uh, uh, um, the process play out, right? That in this thought experiment, or you can also do this in, in, in numerical, uh, in, 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 in the model as well, you put uh, a, a forest uh, 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 next to an open land. And, they, and the, the two patches of landscape uh, are influenced by the same atmospheric conditions in terms of temperature, background temperature in, in terms of incoming solar radiation, long wave radiation. And, and so basically the value that, that those the quantities are the same across the two patches of land at this what we call a blending height, which is uh, typically taking its first model grid, uh, grid height about 50 meters to 100 meters above the surface, right? And then, so in this, this kind of site pair analysis or space for time analysis, the, the contrast between open land, the contrast in temperature between open land and the forest land is really your is really the deforestation signal. Okay, so that's how we 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 approach uh, this this particular problem, right? And so I don't want to get into too much of uh, ma uh, mathematical details here, except to say this is how we frame uh, the, the 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 problem. Um, we combine what we call the one source of uh, model for heat uh, transfer with uh, sur uh, surface energy balance conservation of energy at the surface uh, to, for to formulate a solution for surface temperature. So in this uh, uh, one source model, heat is dissipated from the ground to, to, um, to reference height and using some kind of resistance analog, right? So the, the heat of uh, uh, efficiency of heat flux is really proportional to temperature difference between a uh, difference in temperature between the surface and temperature at a lower atmosphere at uh, uh, the landing height. So you combine those two, uh, two sort of uh, considerations, you come up with a solution for surface temperature. And, uh, and then you do a sort of do a do perturbation to this, right? Mathematically, you just, that's the equivalent to differentiate, uh, differentiating this equation. And so you then you get a, a perturbation signal. That's your temp uh, deforestation signal. Uh, by replacing forest with open land, you get a temperature change. That's the temperature change mathematically. And then the temperature change then is partitioned into three components. The first component has to do with change in albedo, as um, I mentioned earlier, using that Israel example. The second component has to do with the fact that energy redistribution efficiency is changed, uh, uh, changed due to change of roughness. So forest uh, landscape is very rough, uh, very efficient, in generating turbulence is very efficient in dissipating energy by turbulence, but open land is very smooth, so it's not as efficient. So that that itself would ca cause change in temperature. And then the third uh, component contribution is change of energy redistribution due to evaporation change, uh, change of evaporation, and that can go either way uh, when you convert forests to, to urban land, depending on uh, forest or to convert forests to, to open land, depending on which one has higher evaporation potential. So that is uh, the approach we use to, to study uh, deforestation. And it, later on, it turns out that we have two parameters here. One is uh, 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 this uh, local climate sensitivity parameter, which more is more or less constant. 
But this parameter F is energy redistribution factor. Some people have done quite a bit of work on this parameter and turns out this parameter is like a, uh, more like a property of the landscape. So for example, this is a study by Bright et al. looking at energy redistribution factor for different uh, ecosystem, ecosystems. So this is evergreen needle leaf forest, uh, uh, broad, uh, deciduous broadleaf forest, uh, evergreen uh, broadleaf forest. And this is uh, uh, two types of croplands, uh, rain fat irrigated, and this is grassland. Typically, when you compare uh, forest versus the grass open land, uh, you find the energy redistribution factor is much higher for forests, especially for tropical uh, evergreen broadleaf forests, meaning that uh, they are uh, uh, a disturbance, uh, 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 external uh, sort of perturbation would not change its temperature as much as as as, as same perturbation occurring over grassland because uh, over 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 at this kind of landscape, the energy is, can be dissipated very quickly to the atmosphere and therefore is more resistant to, to, to change in temperature. And then uh, uh, later on, um, TC from my lab uh, did this kind of calculation uh, mapping the energy redistribution factor across the, the globe, uh, given the current uh, distribution of vegetation types, of course. And you find the uh, uh, high, high value in tropical Places and low value elsewhere, and then nighttime value is much much lower. So so this uh, um, when you look at day versus night contrast, daytime energy redistribution factor is much higher than at nighttime, meaning that same amount of uh, change of uh, disturbance would cause much higher response in temperature at nighttime than in the daytime. So that kind of diurnal asymmetry is also very important in the consideration of how land use change affects uh, the land surface temperature. So uh, basically then we say, okay, well, well, let's just extend this to urban landscape, right? You extend to urban landscape. Uh, now, instead of contrasting forest versus open land, we are contrasting natural land versus urban land. Uh, so that's the urban heat island signal, right? And so, so you, you go through that, that, that little model, you, you find that now you have five contributions, uh, five factors contributing. One is change in albedo or radiation, the convection effect, evaporation effect, change in storage, and change your anthropogenic heat. So uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, my former student, Lei Zhao, did this attribution analysis based on this, this, uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this model uh, and, and part did a partitioning of urban heat island intensity to, uh, and partition the urban heat island intensity to, to different factors. And this is a very com uh, complex uh, plot, but uh, maybe I should draw your attention just to this, this particular diagram. This diagram is daytime urban heat island situation for, for cities in East and North, uh, Southeast uh, United States, including where we are. And so this is in sort of wet climate. So, um, and this is the MODIS uh, satellite observed urban heat, heat island intensity. This uh, climate model calculate intensity. This is uh, the summation of the in individual terms, uh, individual contributions. Right. So, uh, in the in in the case of um, uh, cities of in this part of the world, actually, um, albedo effect uh, is cooling. So, contrary to what many people believe, uh, turns out cities in this part of the uh, of the country uh, are actually brighter than the uh, background, but then the rural background. Rural background is mostly forest. Forests are dark. So, the albedo effect is actually cooling. But so what surprised us actually is this uh, convection effect, right? In terms of in this uh, in this uh, uh, this kind of climate, uh, this this uh, this region, urban land is not efficient in dissipating heat than the background forest land, and so as a result, uh, the of loss of convection efficiency, you have end up with a lot of warming. So so it's actually this loss of efficiency dominates urban heat island intensity. Um, uh, it's, it's much stronger than the loss of uh, than, than the effect of uh, loss of evaporated cooling, right? So that's that's the the kind of interpretation of of uh, the uh, based on on, on that uh, that model, uh, and and so this kind of uh, attribution, this kind of partition is obviously very important when you try to formulate uh, a mitigation strategy. Whether you want to say, for example, you want to change albedo or change change. Uh, uh, in uh, in evaporating uh, 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 climbing trees by 
improving evaporation. So, so you can use this to help determine which one is more efficient, uh, whether uh, build or change or change of, of, of gray infrastructure or change of green infrastructure, which one gives you more cooling power. And then, so that study was uh, done prior to uh, uh, Google Earth Engine. That was before Google Earth Engine uh, um, uh, 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 error. Uh, so we 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 did we handpicked uh, sixty some cities and we manually select uh, satellite data and, and and that was a lot of work, right? But now uh, with Google Earth Engine, the uh, mapping of urban heat islands is much much uh, much easier. I just want to draw your attention to the work done by TC again. Uh, he used uh, the um, Google Earth Engine to map out basically urban heat island for any for all the cities in the world. Uh, you can go to the uh, this uh, this link and you can pick any city. You can then um, uh, this this interface allows you this uh, this uh, explorer allows you to to uh, map out local urban heat island and also variation uh, time change of the urban heat island over the satellite air. Now, um, now let me switch gear here and, and, and speak about uh, mitigation, right? Mitigation. Uh, we know uh, urban heat island uh, is not a, it's not a good thing, especially in hot weather conditions. It, 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 uh, it exacerbates uh, the heat stress on, on urban residents. We like to perhaps modify the urban landscape to, to, to combat, to control, to reduce uh, the intensity of urban heat island. So uh, this, uh, uh, is this is a, a sort of a, a summary of the kind of strategies people are considering, right? One strategy is white roof. You basically convert a dark roof to uh, and replace dark roof with some kind of uh, white, uh, shiny, bright material to increase albedo. So, so you then uh, cool the uh, urban climate. The other strategy is a strategy promoted by the city of Chicago, uh, Chicago the city of Chicago, uh, putting uh, green vegetation on rooftop, like in the case, this case is the uh, city hall. And uh, a third strategy is the one that the, uh, our school used is to convert a uh, roof, uh, rooftop to solar panel, to cover the rooftop with solar panel. The benefit there is that instead of allowing uh, radiation to turn into heat, you actually capture solar radiation and convert uh, some of it into electricity and, and therefore avoiding uh, heating the local environment, right? So that also bring cooling benefit. And a uh, fourth approach is to use street trees, street trees to help cool uh, uh, whenever you can, uh, wherever you can plant trees to cool the, the local climate. So the question then is which one is more, more effective, right? And if, if, uh, and, uh, if so, uh, how do you quantify? How do you quantify that? Uh, before I, I do give you a solar quantification, I just want to draw your attention to this case in uh, uh, Chicago. It turns out uh, changing rooftop albedo is not a theoretical concept. It's actually been actively promoted in many cities. Uh, city of Chicago was one of the pioneer cities promoting this idea, promoting this approach uh, using uh, brighter reflective materials to help cool the local climate, to help control um, uh, the local uh, uh, urban heat island. This is a, a work done by a former student of at um, uh, with uh, Ron's, uh, Professor Ron Smith and myself. So he quantified change in, in urban uh, uh, albedo uh, uh, in Chicago after 1995, after that notorious heat wave that killed uh, hundreds of people. And, and, and turns out we can actually, we were able to quantify change uh, of uh, the citywide albedo, the city uh, over this time period, the city albedo has increased by a little bit, by 0 0.02. Uh, but so, so you can actually quantify, this is a homework exercise I'll ask my student to do uh, when they do my class, and this is in, in my book, uh, sort of homework exercise. Uh, you know, the question, ask, uh, the question we ask students to do is that when, uh, when the albedo, if albedo is increased by this much, estimate how much temperature reduction you get, right? So you can basically go back to that, uh, that model that we, I, I presented you earlier, but now the situation is much simpler. You don't need to worry about 
change in energy redistribution because we have not changed urban form. We all only did, only what we did was just to change the roof of albedo. So you have a like single parameter uh, problem. And you, if you put numbers together, you find that the 0 0.02 change in increase in albedo uh, would cause a cooling on average of about 0.5 degrees Celsius. That could be a quite important in, in, in the event of a heat wave. Now, um, now let me share you, with you the partition results, right? So we, that in the case of Chicago, that was really a local example. And then we, uh, with, uh, with Lay's work, we, we, we use climate models and in, uh, with for all kinds of scenario considerations, climate consideration, climate scenarios, also mitigation scenarios using our partition effort. So this is a, let me uh, help you interpret this diagram a little bit. This is a, a condition for midsummer day for cities in the United States, average condition for all the cities in the United States, not all cities, 60 some cities in the United States. So this is, will be the current background temperature you get uh, on, hot, on, on summer, uh, summer noontime uh, in, in, in the rural background. Okay, and this is the, uh, the, the urban temperatures here on, on the current climate condition. In the future climate, near the end of century, uh, the rural background will be up here and urban temperature will be up here. So we'll, for urban residents, we, we are gonna expect this much of uh, uh, temperature, right? With reference to current uh, rural background. And so by, impl by, by implementing cool roofs, we, uh, we say in the model, we change all the roofs uh, to, to cool roofs, to high, highly reflective roofs, we get this much of cooling. That, sub, that cooling is substantial, right? It basically it erases all the uh, urban heat island effect and also some greenhouse in, in, uh, effect. And then we say, okay, let's plant tr street trees. Well, there's only uh, uh, limited space for planting street trees, but we planted street trees as, uh, 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 in the model anywhere we can. And also we change reflective pavement change of pavements to uh, reflective material. So this is what we call additive effects. It's like the, uh, the, uh, the idea of a mitigation wedge, right? Uh, people talk about, when we talk about dealing with greenhouse mitigation. Here, you can use the same idea of a wedge idea to see the additive effect of uh, uh, strategies for, for, for mitigating the urban uh, heat island. So, so in this very aggressive, very very uh, aggressive scenario, of course, we can erase all the uh, urban heat island and greenhouse effect. We actually have some additional cooling. Uh, of course, this is highly idealized. In real world, we cannot achieve this this, this maximum cooling. But it's instructive to show that indeed, uh, uh, cool roof uh, uh, strategy is much much more effective than street tree or or, or reflective pavement. So uh, spatially, this is what this looks like, right? If you don't do any, 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 any uh, change to the urban landscape, at the end of the century, you will still you will still have a lot of urban heat island. This each circle, uh, the uh, warm color circles indicate urban heat island. You have a, a few cities that actually have cool uh, urban island, uh, indicated by the by the uh, cold color. Um, but then, nevertheless, on, on average, you get you get a, a quite strong urban heat island. But if you use uh, EPA white roof everywhere in the cities, you actually now have a uh, cold island almost across the whole, whole whole country. This is of course in a daytime situation, but the white roof does not work as well for nighttime. Obviously, right? White roof uh, works because it reflects sunlight. Uh, in the daytime, but at nighttime, there's no sunlight to, to, to stick off. So, so you don't get much of a, a benefit at nighttime. So that still would be a, still a, is an important uh, hurdle to overcome. How do you cool a nighttime temperature? The white roof uh, would not be an effective approach for that. Um, so um, so um, that the, the um, the calculation is done really theoretical, right? In the theoretical calculation, and uh, and we don't really get a sense of the kind of change we are calling for. The change to the urban landform is really substantial if you really want to follow this strategy of, of implement, implementing white roof everywhere. So for that, 
uh, we, we decided to, well, let's do, let's do some visualization. This visualization is based on um, SenseFly uh, uh, a data source, uh, sort of um, uh, drone data collected by, by this company over uh, um, a neighborhood in a city, in, I think in uh, um, Switzerland. And so we, we then use this to end to some animation. Let me see if I can turn the animation on here. Uh, it does not, let me, let me see. Huh, where's my control here? Okay, there it's gone. So, um, this is this is the current landscape, right? It, it, we're doing a flyby as if we were a bird, uh, looking at the landscape from different angles. It's a very pleasant landscape, and you have uh, dark roof, green lawn, and and street trees. And then we say, okay, well, we'd like to change this landscape uh, because we are we are very concerned about urban heat island. So we we then we can artificially, you know, we, we digitally alter the the roof material to uh, white, shiny, high albedo material, and uh, and then we do a flyby, right? So that this is the kind of landscape we are we'll be looking at if um, if we um, if we do implement that white roof strategy and uh, of course is this is is a very alien landscape we are not very used to a lot of people criticize us for saying that because they said this is not a pleasant landscape to uh, city to be to be in um, and perhaps maybe you would even be detrimental to to air, uh, to air, uh, to pilots because they can't see. <laughs> Uh, the 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 ground well and maybe they will get blinded by the uh, uh, brightness of the the, the 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 roof but anyway so so um that's obviously a big change we need to, uh, we will be expecting but now let me switch gear a little bit to to, to uh, uh, what we are doing now so i uh, one big criticism of of the work we we have been doing is that we are using surface temperature as a measure of of heat stress temperature of the surface of, of landscape, but uh, people obviously, uh, this is obviously is not accurate because um, to measure heat stress, you need to use air temperature. And furthermore, uh, uh, heat stress is not only caused by temperature, it's also caused by high humidity. So uh, strictly, you should, we should be using a, some kind of combined index, index that can combine both air temperature, not surface temperature, but air temperature, and also air humidity. Okay, so from a so that perspective, from the thermodynamic perspective, it turns out the best way of measuring the combined effect is to use what we call wet bulb temperature. Meteorolo in meteorology, this is how we measure wet bulb temperature, right? So we cover the thermometer with some kind of wet cloth, allowing the surface of the thermometer to be wet all the time, and so and 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 allow the, the evaporation to occur at the surface. And so the temperature you measure under this situation is wet bulb temperature. And so that's a thermodynamic uh, parameter that uh, meteorologists uh, use a lot to, call, to, to characterize the thermal environment. It turns out, it turns out uh, in, in a hot environment, sweating is obviously is a way, it's the only way actually for us to maintain low skin temperature. Uh, a, a, sweat, a person who is sweating a lot it can be considered essentially a big a wet ball, a big wet ball, because because uh, uh, our uh, we assume the body is exposed, no 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 clothing, and we the whole body is covered with sweat, so analogous to a wet bulb. So 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 then, um, it, uh, then you can use wet bulb temperature to to see uh, the effect of of heat stress on human body, and and uh, as I said earlier. To, to, to stay alive, to, to survive heat stress, heat in hot environment, we need to maintain a 
two degree different difference between skin and 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 a deep body temperature. Uh, so that you know, our our body can dissipate heat uh, to the environment, right? But then it turns out if the wet bulb temperature of the environment goes beyond 35 degrees, this is no longer possible. We cannot, we won't be able to maintain a two degree difference. Our skin temperature will be higher than 35 degrees. And, and um, if we don't have air conditioning. So without air conditioning, we cannot survive when uh, external environmental temperature uh, our wet bulb temperature goes beyond 35 degrees. So that's really the uh, physi physiological uh, barrier, the limit uh, that uh, that you know determines the survivability or habitability of the of the environment. So uh, uh, we are now trying trying to come up with a uh, strategy of of of, of studying uh, using a wet bulb instead of the surface temperature to quantity uh, that's undergoing a new project. It's a collaborative project uh, uh, happening here at Yale. It's called Biking for Science and Health. And so the idea is that we're gonna use bicycles to help us map out uh, temperature and humidity across urban and rural landscape and use that as a way of collecting data to, to, to validate uh, a model calculation. Of course, the, 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 the project of the, uh, objective of this project is much broader, uh, that, that much broader than only measuring temperature. So, so the broad objective is to integrate smart uh, sensor technology with public bicycles or maybe private bicycles as well for urban environmental monitoring. Uh, um, so you see a team of uh, scientists, including Professor Dubrow uh, as, as part of the team. And um, so this is the, the, the idea, right? So we, what we want to do is to convert bicycles into measurement platform, either um, uh, volunteer cyclists, uh, bicycles belonging to volunteer cyclists or public bicycles. So, uh, and then you know, the smart sensor will sense the environmental conditions, temperature, humidity, and in the future, we also want to measure uh, air, air pollutants. And so the sensor would then you turn a cyclist smartphone into some kind of uh, geolocation and data collection device. And the data can then tra get transmitted to some kind of uh, uh, server to allow, and then and uh, in the case of uh, public bicycles, the data would be automatically transmitted to uh, a data server. And then, then the data server would then uh, dispatch data to different uh, users. And so that's the idea. Uh, and so um, we are having some success in terms of uh, de uh, designing a sensor, a smart sensor for temperature humidity. This is a batch of uh, smart uh, temperature humidity sensors, uh, very small. And this is a picture of uh, uh, this uh, smart sensors in, uh, uh, calibrated against commercial sensors, right? To share you with, so this is, oh, sorry, before I share with you uh, the, some data, this is the, the kind of sensor, right? It's very small. Uh, this is the interface, the uh, smartphone interface, and uh, this is to give you a scale of the sensor attached to uh, the bicycle handlebar. And so I'll show you that uh, the idea we have is to recruit volunteer cyclists and, and eventually we're gonna also implement the uh, sensors on, on, on public bicycles. But in case of volunteer cyclists, we are hoping we are designing sort of kind of data interface. This is a work by, by TC and e uh interface to, uh, so that when the data is uh, sent to uh, some kind of uh, data center, uh, uh, the cyclist would receive um, a link. The link then allows the cyclist to view the bicycle route as well as the conditions, a temperature condition uh, and humidity, and maybe in the future also air quality parameters along the route biked. Uh, we are still having trouble with the color scale here, but this is the, the kind of general idea, right? And so you can actually look at, put the, the data, this kind of spaghetti plot under different uh, map background. This is just pure, uh, simple map background. You can put it in a, uh, in a satellite background, map background, or you can put it uh, in, in street map background. So uh, this is pretty, still very much a uh, work in progress. So I will stop here and uh, uh, see if we have questions. I'd like to uh, leave some time uh, to engage uh, with uh, so, some discussion and questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yi, for uh, the wonderful presentation. Uh, why, uh, we do have a lot of questions from the students, uh, but if uh, people, uh, if you have your own questions, please type your question in the chat box 
while I, um, um, Dr. Lee was answering to the students' questions. So um, the first question actually, uh, um, Dr. Lee, you showed very, uh, very uh, interesting results about the um, wide coal roofs. And um, I actually received a lot of questions from the students asking about the, the, the comparison between a white roof versus a green roof. Uh, they were particularly interesting um, in whether, um, what do you think about like the disadvantage of the white roof compared to uh, uh, the green roof? So white roof is, is not very pleasant, right? You, you, don't, you don't like uh, that in your neighborhood. Right? And as I showed you with that uh, drone sort of animation, the landscape is not that pleasant to look at. But in terms of cooling the uh, surface climate, white roof is much, much more effective than green roof. I'll tell you why. In green roof, you have to, um, uh, first of all, it's very difficult to plant trees on, on roof, uh, right? So roof trees tend to sustain, sustain evaporation much more than, than, than grass, than shrubs. So, but if you just plant shrubs and, and grass on rooftop, you have to constantly irrigate them in order to, to get cooling benefit. And the irrigation is not easy, especially if you have a tall buildings and think about pumping water up to the rooftop and irrigate, right? So that's itself is a very energy, very energy intensive uh, endeavor. So, so, so if absence of irrigation, uh, green roof really won't do much to, to, to the local uh, temperature. But I, but I should acknowledge obviously green roof is much more pleasant. Right, it's a, maybe has other benefits um, beyond just cooling the local landscape. So that's a debate, obviously, that people can, should 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 uh, that 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 aspect should be uh, considered uh, uh, when you, when you look at uh, white roof versus a green roof. So if you look at the, the cooling power, uh, street vegetation uh, is more effective than 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 uh, green roof. So if you put green roof here, the effect is really tiny compared to a uh, cool roof or white roof. Um, thanks. Uh, I think we will get more questions on this from the audience, but I, I will move on to um, the other question from the students. The other question students are wondering is like, uh, you, you introduced us about the concept of, of the urban heat island. And students are wondering, like um, a lot of the mitigations we take for the urban area, does that has also a, impact for the adjacent rural areas. Like if we do all this um, wide roof um, in, in the urban area, does it also uh, like um, simultaneously reduce the, uh, the heat exposure in the rural area? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think um, so that really the question maybe can be broadened a little bit to say, uh, that's ur uh, change of urban forms. Uh, in whatever way does it have effect on regional climate or even global climate, right? The answer is probably no, uh, because um, we, are, we are talking about a, a change, uh, intensive change that is, but the, the intensive change uh, uh, is only, occur, only occurs in a very tiny fraction of the landscape. Uh, urban land is what, 2% of the whole terrestrial land surface. And so, uh, and, and uh, that, we, uh, we have intensive modification. That intensive modification will manifest itself in, in localized response, but outside of urban area, the, the, the benefit is really, really not that big. So, so, um, so the answer is probably no. Um, unless we are dealing with like a huge uh, metropolitan region, maybe uh, in India, uh, where you have clusters of cities. A uh, lot of cities cl uh, cluster together. Maybe then there you might have some effect uh, on, on, on background temperature. Um, thanks. I think yeah, yeah. I think if we get a, um, a follow-up question regarding the green roofs. So they were asking one of your paper, uh, the the uh, Jaw and Shoes article. Um, the, in in that paper, there's mixed implementation uh, implementation of the white and green roofs, and given the Green roofs lead to increase the evaporation and likely increase humidity. Would white roofs and green roofs have um, antagonistic uh, effects due to green roofs contributing to the web of uh, temperature? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a that, that's an excellent point. And uh, so, if you take that you know, humidity into consideration, you you probably don't actually you want to avoid you want to avoid uh, 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 green roof uh, because green roof uh, uh, on one hand it will will reduce the air temperature, but on the other hand it will increase uh, humidity, right? So the reduction in air temperature could be totally erased. Uh, the effect of re temperature reduction could be totally erased by enhanced humidity effect. And so, 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 and and of course, in this uh, analysis, the Zhao and Dao analysis, we have not brought in the concept of of wet bulb. But if you bring wet bulb into consideration, that that may be an argument we should uh, consider seriously. Yeah. Uh, also. <laughs> Uh, from the audience, uh, a question regarding the, the, the implementing of the uh, the core the cool roof policy. Do you, have you considered whether you paint all the roofs white or you uh, have a very scattered painting within the city? So do you consider the difference of the, the um, painting? Do you paint all the buildings mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you just scattered? Because so yeah. so in this calculation, we we we. It's a hypothetical calculation. We just convert all the roofs to a high albedo uh, material. In actual implementation, I think you cannot do that because uh, well, there's no point actually uh, doing a one size fits all situation because if you have north facing roofs, right, then then the the reflection is, doesn't doesn't matter as much as south facing roofs. So maybe you need to differentiate north facing versus south facing roofs. In the city of Chicago, they actually uh, uh, have have grades. If you have very steep roof, they ask you. They, they recommend certain kind of albedo values. When you have a uh, less uh, less steep roofs, they recommend other kind of albedo. So so it's a uh, it's a mix of 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 uh, uh, mixed uh, strategies. Um, uh, so, but by but no, a lot of cities are actually ag aggressively promoting especially uh, those kind of reflective mat roof materials. Thanks. I, I guess the, the audience and the students are very interested in, in this topic. So they have a, actually um, both the students and audience ask a question regarding uh, have you ever considered all these urban heat island mitigation measures? They might have some side effects on the air quality. So um, have you um, considered that in your own modeling? Uh, yeah, uh, there's a uh... Uh, so people say maybe for white roof uh, implementation, it's best to do it in clean cities where there's no where, uh, air quality is not a big concern. In polluted cities, when you put it on uh, in uh, white roof, you can change the the way the, that the structure of the boundary layer. Essentially, what happens is if you have a white roof, you are not heating uh, the the lower atmosphere as much, you are reflecting a lot of sunlight away to the outer, to the upper atmosphere and to the outer space, right? So what happens then is you end up with a shallower boundary layer with, with less mixing power, less mixing volume. So you end up with higher air pollution concentration. So that could be a serious side effect, uh, especially in polluted cities. So so that's another, so so, so this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, the harm you could say perhaps caused by, 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 by air quality. That's a very good point. Um, thanks. Uh, um, another aspect of the students are wondering is like, uh, you showed a little bit about the, the different, uh, um, um, like results from the satellite, from the modeling, and the students are particularly interested in when doing this climate modeling. So how can you actually um, sim, uh, simulate the interactions with the global warming and also the, all the uh, biophysical drivers of the urban heat island in the climate models. Okay, so in the climate climate models, right, they, a lot of models don't actually have uh, what we call the city landscape. They, so, but uh, the, the model we use have uh, what we call subgrid parameterization. So within each grid cell, uh, you have different patches of that type of land. So uh, some some grid cells will contain uh, uh, urban land type, urban tile, and and uh, some would have no if there's no urban. So this model actually can calculate within which each grid cell uh, 
um, temperature, humidity, and so on uh, within within the, for each tile. So um, a uh, typically, when you download the data, though the data is aggregated to the grid cell level, so you don't see subgrid, um, subgrid kind of uh, pattern. You don't see uh, subgrid pattern, but uh, but uh, we are able to uh, re redo the calculation and retrieve data within each grid, more grid uh, data for vegetation tile and for urban tile. So that essentially set up the problem for us to have to to, to then compare those subgrid tile data to get the urban heat island from the climate models. That's how a climate model handles uh, landscape heterogeneity within, within a uh, model grid cell. Uh, thanks. I think due to the time limitation, uh, final question is the students and audience are very interested in, uh, in like, what's your recommendations for our daily life in the, as an individual? Is it more eco-friendly to have solar panels or have a cool roof? Uh, solar panel is a very interesting, right? You need to do a very uh, sort of a, sort of a, a, a careful calculation to look at the benefits. So solar panel, the benefit is twofold. One, for, one is that you, like I said, you convert uh, local solar radiation to electricity. And by in doing so, you, you, you don't heat the environment. You don't allow radiation to heat the environment. But the conversion efficiency is not very high. It's not as high as reflection by by cool roof. So on its own, uh, you would say uh, the cooling benefit of solar panel is not as high as uh, as cool roof. But then you have a, an added benefit of electricity generated by like, by solar energy, right? So you offset you offset the demand for uh, fossil fuel energy. So that that benefit is more broad, more diffuse. Is you're offsetting. Uh, energy demand for for fossil fuel, and therefore you cool the whole cl global climate. So this this that that is this that that benefit to that. So that that you need to consider both 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 sides: local cooling versus global cooling versus uh, and offsetting energy. And so 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 that is a, 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 a hard a subject that's been heatedly debated, right? But I think if you are if you want to conserve. Uh, uh, your electricity bill. If you want to reduce your electricity bill in your house, the, your the best approach is actually having uh, having a, a cool roof. Uh, if you add a cool roof on your rooftop, then you, you, the demand for AC is will be substantially reduced. You will have a lot of electricity saving in that way. That Wonderful. has been demonstrated by 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 a lot of people actually. Wonderful suggestion. Uh, thank you for all the insightful uh, discussion and also the, the presentation. And uh, with that, I think uh, we thank uh, Dr. Lee for this wonderful presentation. And I thank you all for coming for our uh, seminar. Thank you Bye very much. Everyone. See you guys.